And without further ado, I'll announce our next speaker, Besto. Thank you so much. All right, last session, you made it. And if you're here, that means uh, hangover has cleared enough. Uh, another housekeeping item uh, to keep it more interactive, uh, I've asked the guys at the door to check for eggs and tomatoes, so it should be safe. Uh, I'll take questions uh, while I speak. If you have a question, don't wait until the end. Just raise your hand uh, as soon as uh, I pause. Uh, I'll call you out. Uh, a bit about me. Uh, I run security engineering at IDME. Uh, my team has two functions. One is a DevOps function for security as an organization, uh, designing and deploying new capabilities. And the other is an SRE function uh, for security as well. Uh, automating the, the infrastructure operations, uh, responsible for reliability, good stuff like that. So who's IDME? Uh, we're identity verification provider and a digital wallet. A little bit like uh, PayPal, uh, but for identity attributes, not financial information. You can onboard any identity attribute about yourself in a digital wallet that we can legally verify. And then you can use it with anybody who would trust us. So in theory, if your local library has an API that we can use to verify your membership, you can onboard your card and then you can use it with the library. Our biggest customers are public sector right now, uh, 30 states, number of uh, federal agencies, uh, and so we've been publicly credited with preventing more than 273 billion uh, in fraud. Uh, ultimately, the credentials that uh, we give you because uh, they're tied to your legal identity are portable anywhere across uh, the internet. You can use it for public uh, access to services, commercial services, so anything. The caveat is that they need to trust us, of course. Mm. Another tidbit is that uh, for Puerto Rico, for example, uh, we've increased access to government services, the ability for people to verify their identity and get access, uh, more than double to 83% uh, and upwards. So, why are we talking about uh, boundary protection? Is this just uh, another moat? Uh, the point of the design that we're talking about is to create a set of uh, patterns that are based on a threat model uh, and focus on traffic crossing trust boundaries. Either uh, external traffic coming into the cloud environment, connections uh, from the apps uh, egressing out, or uh, interrupt uh, communications. Uh, can we enable something like cloud IDS across all traffic? We can, but then can we pay our monthly bill at the end of the month? We can't, we're still a private company. So the point is what is a sufficient set of controls that we can apply to minimize the attack surface and try to either restrict attackers within a trust boundary or in order to break out so to uh, make them either step up their game uh, or be more noisy, make it easier to detect. Uh, it's not a complete security architecture and it doesn't include implementation uh, details. So it assumes that you have some pre-existing knowledge of what VPCs are, service controls, firewalls, uh, things like that. Uh, we'll cover six different uh, use cases uh, for traffic crossing trust boundaries. This is what uh, we observe in our environment. Uh, basically, um, engineers, so DB admins, uh, accessing infrastructure to the backdoor, uh, SSH, uh, database connections, things like that. Uh, internal users or admins accessing uh, applications through the front door. Uh, members of the public accessing web apps, uh, apps egressing, and then uh, two use cases related to app-to-app -app communication, either within a cluster or uh, between clusters uh, crossing different uh, VPCs. 
So the high-level overview of the environment for context. Um, all devices that enter into the environment uh, are managed and all are enrolled uh, with a device certificates. Uh, internal users use uh, hardware tokens, uh, hardware keys for access, and each application requires uh, MFA. Uh, not just the corporate devices, but uh, cloud assets also run uh, EDR um, across the board. And all the internal traffic is routed through a SASE service before it gets to the cloud environment and goes over internal DNS. It's what we call corp native, even though it sounds a little bit like a dirty word in a cloud context. Uh, generally, we don't allow uh, in interactive uh, access that's not through the front door. Uh, SSH access to production is, uh, by exception, break glass uh, mostly. The environment itself is uh, managed as uh, code. Um, DB admins have uh, an exception. There are a couple of other use cases like that, but they're explicitly authorized and by exception. Uh, and they land uh, at a fine-grained authorization proxy uh, before going anywhere. Uh, and the traffic between them and the proxy uh, is HTTPS, and then whatever protocol you authorize to use is between the proxy and uh, inside uh, the environment. Uh, it's a hub and spoke uh, model with a bunch of production VPCs aligned to the lines of business that we have uh, or for uh, shared services. Uh, VPCs in GCP work a bit differently than in AWS, so if you're not familiar. All traffic also uh, tunnels from uh, the SASE service to a cloud connectivity hub, and then from there, manage circuits uh, into the, the environment. Uh, and similarly, the external traffic uh, goes through a cloud router. So this is just for context, what are some of the control points that uh, we'll talk about later uh, for enforcing security controls. So, uh, first use case that we have for uh, engineers accessing applications uh, through the back door. Um, they connect first uh, through the, uh, the SASE service via a standard uh, VPN connection. Uh, all policies are identity-based uh, per group. Uh, and they land uh, at the authorization proxy where, uh, let's say, VESCO is explicitly authorized to access these five servers via SSH only. Uh, I don't have a persistent credential. It's uh, checked out uh, just in time with uh, just enough access. And it's valid only for the duration of the session. Um, the actual connection I already mentioned that between the proxy and the server is uh, the only thing that runs uh, protocols other than HTTPS. And again, I have to provide the uh, hardware token MFA twice, once connecting to the SASE service and then once uh, to the authorization proxy. Uh, the main goal of that is to restrict an attacker to the opportunity for uh, least resistance type of uh, access if they get a foothold on the user device would be to abuse the authorized access of uh, the user. So my access to the five servers only. Uh, anything else beyond that uh, requires uh, additional techniques uh, like breaking out uh, of a container, uh, finding a zero-day vulnerability in the authorization proxy uh, or the app uh, or something like that. Um, noisier, hopefully easier to detect. Right now, uh, we do uh, regular manual reviews. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that doesn't scale but so far has worked for us is that we're still a fairly small company. Uh, if you take engineering and security, uh, total is a couple of hundred people. Once you bundle that into teams, the identity-based policies are per group, not per user, unless you have as a user some exceptions that your group uh, doesn't have as a whole. So that ends up to a small handful of uh, rules. They're easy to check. So for this specific use case, you have to use a YubiKey, so you cannot uh, use a mobile device. Uh, the only mobile devices that are allowed are to stage and not production, and therefore mobile QAs. So the second use case, uh, for internal access uh, of uh, end users uh, to the front door. Uh, similarly, access is restricted to applications on an explicit uh, basis. Uh, you have to have uh, access to this specific application. Uh, there are not a huge number of applications that a user would access internally that are not uh, on the public internet. Generally, for things that are not homegrown, we prefer SaaS services. So there is a small handful of uh, homegrown applications that internal users should uh, regularly access. Um, this is where things like context-aware uh, access comes in and VPC service controls. That adds uh, the ability to check uh, the device posture of uh, the user, uh, location, um, things like impossible travel, does it come from uh, our internal IP space, which is where internal DNS is uh, helpful. Um, VPC service controls explicitly restrict what type of data is allowed uh, to be extracted from an application. Uh, and move out of a VPC. Now, there are valid use cases for users accessing the web interface to download files, uh, but the goal is to make sure that only expected and uh, explicitly authorized type of uh, data can be uh, downloaded at the network level, and then whether you're inside the thread trying to exfiltrate data or something like that, uh, that suggests that uh, other layers of uh, the security stack. Not necessarily something we can address uh, at the network boundary or a trust boundary. Uh, so again, uh, the goal is to try and restrict an attacker to, uh, without additional, uh, more significant efforts, uh, only be able to abuse uh, existing authorized access for a user uh, and only during a session. Uh, because of the hardware token. You need to have a foothold on a device and sit and watch until I connect to an application uh, in order to grab anything within that session. This is more uh, for completeness sake. So external access to web applications is the most uh, standard uh, scenario. There's nothing additional here that we currently do uh, beyond the routing all traffic through a CDN uh, web app API protection layer um, before you get to an application. Um, the main uh, thread scenarios are traditional OWASP type of uh, web app attacks, uh, API attacks, uh, zero-day vulnerabilities that are not addressed uh, at the network boundary. What about internal app uh, access to external services? 
because we rely on uh, SaaS services and as part of the verification flow, we rely on uh, many partners to check, let's say, financial records, phone records, and so on. Uh, applications do need to egress uh, to uh, m multiple services. Uh, that's allow list uh, only. Applications are explicitly authorized to access a fixed number of uh, services. Uh, and all access uh, goes through a cloud net or a secure web proxy, depending on the type of access the application needs and the application uh, thread profile. And not all applications go through the web proxy. All applications go through cloud net. Um, with So far, outside of a couple of exceptions, it hasn't been an issue. Uh, we use an internal certificate uh, authority with Google CAS tied to vote. So for internal certificates, this is what you would find on the applications. And then uh, external public certificates are on the origin load balancers. Yes, but again, so far hasn't been an issue. Plus, um, for use cases where um, the origin load balancer needs to connect to something, this is where we would need to worry since in the internally issued uh, certificates, those we can always uh, decrypt. Uh, those are already... Uh, outside of the immediate application trials boundary. They're at a different layer uh, that goes through additional checks that would come uh, a bit later. Um, for those use cases also, we've started looking at uh, B2B type of uh, connections. So far we haven't used B2B connections, but uh, we'll start. Uh, when I joined 18 months ago, more or less all traffic was growing was going through a CDN. Internal employees going uh, the same way as external users through uh, public DNS, the public internet, and uh, through the CDN, uh, which was a bit excessive. Mm. With CloudNet, the application itself doesn't need to have uh, external public IP. Uh, it's just a service that ties the application IP uh, and allows it to egress. Um, that's, uh, that makes nothing much easier than having a separate uh, appliance in line. Uh, and uh, recently we started using the cloud uh, web proxies to specifically uh, either block uh, or allow lists of uh, external services. Mm. Originally, the intent was to use uh, allow lists only. We found that uh, we need uh, block lists in some cases as well. We've seen an increase in um, like premium phone number attacks, for example, that have nothing to do with us as a business, just targeting any MFA endpoint out there trying to force uh, SMS back to the original phone number. So th these tend to go, whole ASNs tend to go into a blacklist so for either period of time or if we see repeat attacks, so just stay there. In this scenario, uh, the main threat scenario is a supply chain attack. Um, Again, it's no longer within the scope of a boundary. For internal app-to-app -app communication within a cluster, um, all business applications uh, run in a nomad uh, clusters. Uh, so console uh, and uh, envoy control uh, traffic within the cluster. 
Uh, we're in the middle of a migration uh, to GCP. So as part of that, uh, across clouds, uh, it was easier to use uh, not to opinionated service like uh, Nomad Console um, and with Voditize uh, nicely together uh, for providing just in time access. It's more or less uh, pre-integrated. Uh, the applications uh, that talk to each other across um, the Envoy proxies are again explicitly authorized within the service mesh. Uh, by default, uh, all the traffic is blocked. Uh, the Envoy proxies do all the network uh, security that's kind of taken care of uh, for you. It's also makes it easier for developers to not have to worry about uh, any of that. Uh, the traffic is completely uh, isolated from any service outside of the service mesh. Uh, so that means if you want to inspect traffic in, a, in the service mesh, right? It has to be uh, egressing the service mesh. You can you can add a service that does that explicitly. Uh, the service mesh itself does some level of uh, not necessarily monitoring but uh, inspection. Um, but it doesn't do anything like anomaly detection, uh, any anything more advanced security specific. Right now we don't do that either because clusters are fairly small, well understood, and. The egress is a, also a good control point. So the, from a boundary perspective, the main uh, threat scenario is, again, an attacker abusing authorized app access. They can break out potentially uh, outside of the container, outside of uh, the cluster or, or the mesh, uh, but that's again addressed at the platform uh, security layer, plus uh, the intent is to make it more noisy, more aggressive, um, easier to detect, have to review the more advanced techniques. Yeah. Uh, yes, but um, from the native integration between a Nomad Console and Vote, uh, credentials are again uh, time-based and session-based. They're not persistent. So in most cases, you don't need to rotate them. Uh, and uh, certificate rotation overall is uh, handled by votes. Mm. And the, the infrastructure as a whole is uh, fully terraformed. Uh, we tend to uh, update with a new Packer image uh, every two weeks uh, and refresh uh, all the clusters. All the infrastructure is rebuilt every couple of weeks. Uh, so it's generally patched uh, fairly quickly. There's some exceptions that have to be persistent, stateful, VM-based services just because uh, they're not designed to be stateless. Um, we very grudgingly allow those. For applications communicating across uh, VPCs, uh, that's where um, Envoy and Console themselves uh, have uh, ingress gateways per uh, service. So any service that needs to communicate outside of the cluster would go through the ingress gateways and would be explicitly authorized. Um, that would be, back to your question, a uh, good uh, inspection point. Uh, the VPC service controls uh, make sure that only authorized traffic and data can egress. Uh, we explicitly authorized what type of data is expected to leave the VPC 
per application depending on what's the business purpose of uh, that application. Um, all the traffic goes through a cloud router in the hub and spoke uh, model. Uh, and this is the only scenario where we do uh, IDS type of uh, ongoing uh, traffic monitoring. Generally, uh, IDS is uh, fully terraformed and we have playbooks to enable it at any VPC uh, or egress point, but that's driven by the on-demand security operations needs to run a specific runbook or a specific investigation or in some cases tied to detections. Uh, if you see this type of suspicious activity, start uh, mirroring traffic uh, and inspecting it. And it's more for investigations than the expectation that the uh, IDS uh, would uh, detect something. Uh, we do persistent monitoring only for the traffic crossing trust boundaries between applications. Uh, and the intent uh, for that is once again uh, to restrict the uh, attacker to abuse the access that an application is already authorized to have. Um, th the more dangerous part would be egressing from a lower trust uh, environment into a higher trust. So the environment. Cloud IDS generally does things like uh, app masquerading, detections, and so on. Though so far we've seen very few true positive suspicious activity and has mostly been internal activities. Like edge cases of um, applications to developers that haven't fully migrated, so someone still needs to do something. Is there like radiation insider behavior there? Not uh, on the network boundary. Uh, we do on the user devices and we do on the cloud assets themselves. Um, on the cloud assets, the EDR is as much a detector as it's just a data source that then uh, we create uh, detections uh, based off of. Oftentimes, because we know the environment, uh, we know the applications, it's easier to craft a custom detection than to use the out-of-the-box uh, models. So we'll wrap up a bit early. We'll have more time for questions. As a last session, you'll get a bit of a longer break. Any final questions? Okay, it's, um... So you got, thanks. You, you obviously got that on and got lots of federal customers. So I'm assuming for things like, you know, your certification's important, you have FedRAMP, other certifications. I'm assuming this architecture was a big part of that certification. Um, can you kind of comment on how that architecture helped or didn't uh, through the certification process? So it's a big part of recertifying the environment and supporting growth in new business. But we've had a FedRAMP authorization for a number of years uh, already. And the original certification is in a environment that looks uh, nothing like this. Uh, so again, looks nothing like this. This is uh, Greenfield. We've been very lucky that uh, as part of uh, expansion and migrating to GCP, we had nothing pre-existing, so we've redesigned basically everything. Uh, originally, the first applications were not built as containerized applications that were running in VMs, which is part of the reason why we chose Nomad and Consul, because they can orchestrate not just containers, but VMs, bare metal. Uh, we can run them from a developer and CI CD perspective the same way uh, in any cloud provider. Uh, Yep, of course, any significant change to security controls has to go through a FedRAMP authorization. 
This is now part of our jump authorization boundary, but the authorization boundary was established before we had any presence in GCB. So can't credit it for the authorization itself. But it's much easier to get an authorization because GCP as a whole is uh, FedRAMP uh, moderate or high. All services are considered uh, authorized. So if I want to use the cloud web proxy, which is fairly new, I can. I don't have to go to a separate authorization versus bringing an external third party proxy from a cool new startup that hasn't already been FedRAMP authorized. I need to authorize that as part of my boundary now. And it takes at a minimum 90 days to get a significant change request to the federal process. My background is in financial services. I thought those regulations are onerous. It's nothing like federal. Cool. If there are no further questions, thank you guys.